<laughs> I know everybody is excited. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm Anna Ingers Lopez. I'm the chair of the art department. We're very excited about this symposium. Thank you all for coming out um, this evening. This event would not have been possible without its many supporters, funders, and organizers. Uh, first, our deepest appreciation goes to Eric Weitz of the Division of Humanities and the Arts for his ongoing critical support of the art. We'd also like to thank the Rifkin Center and the Martin and Tony Sosna President's Fund for excellence for the generous, generous funding they provided. We present this symposium in conjunction with the Gray Art Gallery of NYU as part of their extensive public programming for their current exhibition, The Left Front, Radical Art in the Right Decade, 1929 to 1940, which ends on April 4th. So if you haven't seen it already, you've got to run out and, and see it. At the Gray, um, we especially wish to thank Lucy Oakley for collaborating with us and for all of her support. Teresa uh, Hioki, an MA candidate in art history and our current visual resources assistant, made this event happen. Her dedication, thoughtfulness, and resourcefulness demonstrate all that is good and inspiring about CCNY students. She's among our best and brightest, so thank you. I'd also like to thank the entire art department, faculty, and staff, and express special gratitude to Becca Albee, Mark Dewhurst, Craig Hauser, Lisa Kerr, Kaya Motoregger, and Harriet Semi. This symposium seeks to highlight our shared belief in the power of the arts to exact positive change and our dedication to making the arts relevant to heterogeneous audiences. In our four graduate programs in various undergraduate areas, many of our 680 majors, yes, 680 majors, ask how they can make a difference and how they can use art either by making, teaching, designing, or analyzing it as a tool for social change. The Gray Art Gallery exhibition includes a riveting video that documents the mass political fervor and utopianism of a May Day march on Union Square in the mid-1930s, for which Mexican artist David Alfaro Siqueiros created innovative floats produced in his experimental workshop on 14th Street. And kudos to Lucy Oakley, who uh, found the video and included it uh, in the exhibition. It's something I've studied for a long time and I, I had never seen it. The video provides us with a living testimonial of the ways in which vanguard and radical art immersed itself in and transformed the urban sphere. In a distinct historical moment with its own set of urgencies, in particular, the depression and the onslaught of fascism. It was a moment that inspired famed art historian Maya Shapiro to argue in his text, The Social Basis of Art, that there is overwhelming evidence which binds art to the con conditions of its own time and place. Um, Teresa, maybe we can get chairs and put them in the front so people can them. Or someone to help Teresa. <laughs> in recent times, social crises like the AIDS epidemic, for example, galvanized movements, if not a whole generation of artists. In terms of art now, for some, the will to produce a revolutionary art is perceived as a nostalgic leftist position. In other forums, radicalism is repackaged as mere optimism without any substantive political, critical, or theoretical platform. In light of the commodification of so-called social practice, the critical debates regarding the viability of relational aesthetics, and the upsurge of community-oriented practices, this symposium asks, where do we stand today in terms of the possibilities and limitations of so-called socially engaged practices? Dred Scott, Johanna Feitman, and Carlos Mota will shed light on these topics and questions by presenting specific projects and interventions that broaden, complicate, and challenge our understandings of the public sphere in relation to race, gender, queer politics, and state power. Our spirited moderator, Eva Frank, will then engage the panelists in a philosophical and critical discussion regarding art, activism, and cultural production. I direct you now to consult the program for the participants' extensive and impressive biographies. In order to save time, I won't read aloud their many accomplishments, but thank them enormously for joining us in this uptown discussion and for sharing their significant perspectives and rigorous work with us all. And so, without further ado, I invite Dred to the podium. Uh, th 
thank you. And this is really cool. It's like people coming to hear artists talk and it's standing room only and that's really weird. Um, but really great. So um, I'm going to, in just a second, show some images. I, I want to make sure that that is possible. So I've got a quick tech question. If I get forward on this, do we suddenly go to me or? Um, well, let's, let's just look forward and see what happens. No. Um, so if you could get mine. Was on the desktop. Just open this up. Okay. And the screen is supposed to be black. So anyway, I, I'm going to start, and, you know, uh, just talking for like a half second. And you know, I think this is really good that we're talking in part. We mentioned the word state power and revolution. And you know, I want to say, you know, I make revolutionary art to propel history forward. Many of you won't be able to see what this is, but this is several victims of police murder, murder by police. This is part of why, not the only reason, but it's part of why we need revolution. In talking about revolutionary art, a lot of times people talk about it as sort of a fashionable thing of just making socially engaged work, or political work, or radical work. We actually need state power. We need a different power. We need different social relations. We need to get actually get to a new state power where then people can be working towards eliminating classes and getting to a world where we can actually relate to each other as freely associating human beings. So that's the background for what my art is going to be talking about and showing. So I'm just going to jump into the art. Um, and we're going to, but that's, you know, when I talk about revolution, I actually mean we need state power. We need to run the world in a completely different way than it's being run. And so, this is a project called Wanted. Um, Wanted masquerades as a series of uh, Wanted posters. Um, and they are Wanted posters for things that are not illegal that the police routinely are asking you for. Um, wanted for unspecified reasons. Perpetrator, probable cause to stop in question. Unk, unk, male, black, height 5 foot 9, weight 180 pounds, black hair, hair black, eyes unknown, last known address, 000, unknown, unknown. On Friday, July 18, 2014, at approximately 19.45 hours, a male black, approximately 19 to 23 years of age, was wearing a blue overshirt and black denim pants and was observed standing in front of a building at 949 West 26th Street. Um, this was a project that was a community engaged project. Um, it had several different layers from meetings, to, from working with youth for about three months. And youth, I mean, when I say that, I mean uh, young men and women aged about 16 to 20, most of them 17 to 18 years old. There were forums. There there was, this is a sketch session with a police sketch artist, and I'm going to, in a second, uh, show you a video of that. And this was done as performance. And so um, this forensic sketch session, which was the basis upon which a lot of the posters were created, or all of them were created, um, is sort of how it happened. So I'm going to just show you that video and talk more about it in a bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we keep going on that, you know. As part of this artwork, several young adults and activists met in Harlem to discuss police intrusion into the lives of youth and how the youth are criminalized. The following day, five adults gave descriptions of five youth who they only briefly met to Kevin Blythe Sanson, a police trained composite sketch artist. Samson made sketches based on these descriptions. All right. So the way we do the composite is first I'm going to get a, a physical a description of you, which I'm going to, a description of the suspect. I'm going to write that down. Just you know, just catch it. I'm going to write that down. After I do that, we're going to start building a, a composite. What we're looking for is not a. We're not trying to make a portrait. We're trying to make a likeness. Um, can I ask you how long you saw the person for? One minute. Just a minute? It's going to be fun. <laughs> you saw him for one minute, okay. Is this a male or female? Yeah. There's a male, good. Um, the race? Uh, dark skin. Dark skin. Could you tell if they were African American, Hispanic, or? You could? Okay. By dark skin, you mean? Dark skin, dark, dark. Uh, dark light skin. 
Okay. Dog. Light skin. Okay, let me show you a picture. Dog. Dog is iron? No. Okay. A little lighter. Lighter than iron. Okay. Would you say that that person was thin, fat, medium? So we have a black, um, a dark skinned male, early 20s, clean shaven, slim, with pointy eyes. What color would you say he was out of these pictures? Do you see anything here? Yeah, maybe these are. These colors, okay. So our face shape, let's start with the shape of her face. I'm going to say that it was... There's many more pictures, sir. I'm going to be nice to make a light here on. I'm going to just block in the face real quickly, and um, as we go along, we'll be fine. And you said, but they were fuller than these ones. Yeah, a little bit fuller, okay. but that's That's sort of shape. Would you describe this guy as, I hate to put you on the spot, handsome, mm -hmm. ugly, um, normal, you know, generic looking guy? Handsome. Handsome, okay. Would you describe this guy as handsome, ugly, normal, you know, generic looking guy? Handsome. Handsome, okay. It doesn't look like I'm saying, you know, we keep working. Okay. Yeah, and, and keep in mind that they're going to Xerox these when they do it's going to, it's going to drop. It's going to get two shades darker. I'll make it darker and print it. It's going to be like, you know, when you guys see it. These sketches, which were both specific and generic, were then inserted into wanted posters that describe non illegal activity for which the police routinely harass young adults, especially young black and Latino men. And so the text that people wanted for, for unspecified reason or furtive movement were all taken from NYPD police reports of when they said they stopped and frisked somebody and the reasons they did it. So of the five million plus people they stopped in the eight years leading up to 2012, 43% of the people that were stopped were stopped because they moved furtively. About 10% of the people, over uh, you know, 500,000 people, thought that they, the police thought they were lookouts. About 12%, over 500,000 people fit the description of some known criminal in the eyes of the police. And if you do the math, that means about 90% of the young black and Latino men in uh, New York City look like known criminals to the cops. So the kicker in this, if we flip the script, was, so these were youth that wanted to be on the other person. <laughs> These were going to be installed up and down the streets of Harlem. So from Broadway and 125th up to Malcolm X, and from Malcolm X and 125th up to 145th and Malcolm X, these were put into pizza shops, bodegas, delis, um, nail salons, barber shops. But the kicker was that it flipped the script on it. It says that at the end, it says that the suspect is wanted by his family, friends, and neighbors. To download copies of this poster and display it, go to www.wantedposter.com. And so the, you know, the language was just the kind of language that's taken from these wanted posters, but this flips it, because we wanted to have a, a conversation with the community about how the youth were being dogged and criminalized and actually involve them in, in challenging and undermining that and actually going back and embracing the youth. Um, and so this is just a shot in the bodega. We had some large ones made that were then fly pasted up on the construction sites. And we knew that you know if people saw one or two that, that you might ignore them like you just think it's a typical wanted poster but if you see hundreds along the street you're like wait a minute i have to check this out what did they do and it was actually able to insert into that conversation on that street change things
The Dred Scott Decision, Opinion of Chief Justice Taney. Transcript of Dred Scott versus Sanford, 1857, December time, 1856. Dred Scott versus John F. A. Sanford. Dred Scott, plaintiff in error, the John F. A. Sanford. Chapter one, one. Upon a writ of error to a circuit court of the United States, the transcript of the record of all proceedings in the case is brought before this court and is open to inspection and revision. Four, a free Negro of the African race whose ancestors were brought to this country and sold as slaves is not a citizen within the meaning of the Constitution of the United States. Five, when the Constitution was adopted, they were not regarded in any of the states as members of the community which constituted the state and were not numbered amongst its people or citizens. Consequently, the special rights and immunities guaranteed to citizens do not apply to them. And not being citizens within the meaning of the Constitution, they are not entitled to sue in that character in a court of the United States where the circuit court has not jurisdiction in such a case. Six, the only two clauses in the Constitution which point to this race treat them as persons who it was morally lawful to deal in as articles of property and hold as slaves. Seven, since the adoption of the Constitution of the United States, no state can, by any subsequent law, make a foreigner or any other description of persons citizens of the United States, nor entitle them to the rights and privileges secured to that citizen by the instrument. Eight, they had, for more than a century before, been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect, and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. He was bought and sold and treated as an ordinary article of merchandise and trafficked whenever it was profit to be made upon the same principles which prevailed at the time of the Declaration of Independence. As it relates to these states, it is too plain for argument that they have never been regarded as part of the people or the citizens of the state, nor supposed to possess any political rights which the dominant race might not hold, withhold, or grant at their pleasure. <laughs> America enslaved millions of Africans, continued to enslave millions of their descendants after the Civil War, and currently imprisons 12% of their male descendants age 20 to 34. Furthermore, 33% of African-American men will be imprisoned during their lifetime, and many will face legalized discrimination. Neither presidential candidate plans to eliminate this mass imprisonment. A vote for either candidate implies acceptance of continuing this legacy. With knowledge and full understanding of this, I, fill in your name, will slash will not vote in the 2012 presidential election. In, in introducing the questionnaire to people and said, would you have voted during slavery and would you vote in a segregated election? And this is the artwork that they were given, which just reprinted the, the text from the questionnaire, along with a reproduction of the original lithograph from the historic Dred Scott from, done at a time when, during when he was alive. And the, the votes were not tabulated. They didn't have any effect on the outcome of the performance. And this is a shot from uh, the 60s, the fire rosing of civil rights demonstrators in, in Birmingham in 1963. Um, and this is a performance I did because all on the uh, impossibility of freedom in a country founded on slavery and genocide, where I sort of referenced that fire hosing of, of civil rights demonstrators. Um, and the point was actually to show the, the strength and courage and, and, and heroism of the people that withstood the brutality that was being meted out to them. That, that was the essence of what these photographs were. They were not fundamentally about the oppression, but of people standing up to it. And so it was a durational performance of me versus the high pressure water from a fire hose. And a lot of my work references history how, and utilizes how history both sets the stage for the present 
but exists in the present in new forms. So this was both tying that historic civil rights movement to the hands up, don't shoot, Black Lives Matter, which for many of the, there were about 500 people that saw this performance, about 200 of them were kids from a Bed-Stuy High School, um, which is an art school, but they, they don't often get to see live contemporary performance. And this really, really resonated with them because these kids really felt that any of them could be the next Mike Brown. And it was done in October of, of last year. And this is just a glimpse to a project that I'm working on now. It's a long-term project. It will probably be presented in about um, two years. Um, it's a project called Slave Rebellion Reenactment. Um, it will reenact the largest rebellion of enslaved people in US history, which occurred in 1811 outside of New Orleans. Um, the slave army got to about 500 people, but part of what's interesting about this beyond its size um, is that while it was never likely to succeed, it could have succeeded. And success was not just get revenge by killing some white people or get revenge by killing some white people and escape to the swamps and set up a maroon colony. They, were, they had a plan. They planned for months, and their plan was to um, solve the problem that confronted them. Their problem was that they were enslaved. Their solution was to rise up, seize the city of New Orleans, and end slavery. And New Orleans at the time was largely a French colony. And so it's it's not out of the question that were they successful in that, it would have radically altered US history and world history. And so for us, comprehending and understanding that um, uh, the past was not predetermined also opens up the possibility that the future is not predetermined. And so this is sort of a Photoshop version of what this will look like, of the past colliding with the present, a, a sort of uh, slave army um, with 500 people in, in uh, period specific costume with horses and muskets and sabers and cane knives marching on to New Orleans in the area where this rebellion originally took place, which the sugar plantations now being replaced by oil refineries and chemical plants and, and trailer parks and gated communities. And so I'll end on this work, imagine a world without America. Um, as time's running out, I don't have a lot of time to talk about that, but you can obviously see that Florida and New York and Maine and Alaska make it into it, but the rest of the United States doesn't. Um, but this is not about geography. It's actually about getting people to dream of a world. I think there needs to be a lot more imagining and dreaming right now. That's actually a, a limitation that keeps keeps people from really fighting for a world that we really want to look, live in and complicating that by imagining it without America. Whether you think America is a force for evil, a force for good, or something in between, um, thinking of a world without America and the disproportionate influences is a good um, sort of thought experiment and it opens up the possibility for much more radical change. And with that, I will say one other thing that this, the text imaginable without America is something I came across, a, a statement by Bob Bacon, who's the leader of the Revolutionary Communist Party, is something that I read from him about 25 years ago. And here he is actually in a recent talk at Riverside Church with Cornell West in a talk he gave called Revolution and Religion, the, uh, the Fight for Emancipation and the Role of Religion. That talk, um, a dialogue between Cornell West and Baba Bacon, and that talk is actually about to come out as, on, on this Saturday coming up um, as a film. And it's going to be at John Brooks Center, it's going to be screened at lots of other places. The film's really badass. Bacon and, and West have a tremendous amount of love and respect for each other. They have differences over the question of religion, but if people want to get free, if you guys are dreaming and wanting to get free, I strongly encourage you to get a ticket and go to the John Brooks Center. You can go to revcom.us. Um, to find out how to do that, um, and it will also be streamed online. But I'm basically at time, and hopefully after hearing some other really kick-ass presentations, we can have a good conversation about some of what I and my other panelists have said. So thank you. Hi, I'm Johanna Feidman. Um, thank you to Anna and Teresa for organizing such a great event. And um, I'm honored to speak alongside Ted Scott and Alex Maka. Uh, and thank you, Ava, for leading the discussion afterwards. Um, the text I'll be reading from was published um, this month in Art in America. And it's um, 
A diary of my experience this past summer collaborating with the Russian feminist group Pussy Riot. Uh, but I wanted to preface um, that piece um, with you know, some background on me and my work um, with my Dan Latibra because I feel like that's, um, it'll help sort of put in context why the collaboration happened, why it made sense, or what happened. So, um, Latibra was my band. Um, it was formed in 1998 by Kathleen Hanna, Sadie Benning, and me. And Kathleen, um, by the mid 90s, was already very well known as the singer of Bikini Kill, um, which was um, kind of the iconic, um, most known band um, associated with the riot call movement. Uh, Sadie um, is a video maker and a visual artist uh, who became known in the 90s also for her diaristic videos. She shot with the Fisher Price Pixel Vision camera. And I, at the time, was a writer and a painter. I had just finished art school in New York City. Um, and that's when Latifah got together. Um, so Latifah was always more um, than just a band. It was more um, than, it, it wasn't just about the songs. It was conceived of as a kind of multimedia project from the start. Um, and we also conceived of ourselves as sort of post riot girl in terms of our personal histories with that radical youth movement, but also aesthetically, um, we were up to riot girl's sensibility to electronic music. Um, so this is me, uh, JD, and Kathleen, and actually Sadie um, was a really important part of Latigro's first year, um, but then she left the band and JD Sampson joined the band. Um, so that's a picture taken uh, in a Tokyo photo booth, probably. <laughs> I don't know, 2000. Um, so in Latifa, at first we traveled with a slide projector. Um, and this is, uh, I just, I like this picture because you can see how the slides work. This is Kathleen performing our song Bang Bang, which was um, about the murder of Amadou Diallo. Um, he was murdered by the police and shot 41 times, and that was um, something we were outraged about. We were outraged by the Giuliani administration's um, attitude towards police violence in our city. Um, and then I was just going to show about a minute of um, the video for Hot Topic. This is a song that we wrote in 1999, but later we upgraded from slides to video and our friend Mick Friedman made um, a video that was projected behind us. So I think I did. Well, that song and that video um, is kind of a tribute to our feminist and queer and um, radical heroes. Um, and I think it was kind of an important, it was in some ways our mission statement. Um, although there were lots of things we were angry about and many songs that we wrote in direct protest to certain events or ideas, institutions, um, we also spent a lot of time trying to um, support our contemporaries and our 
um, people that we felt um, we were in struggle alongside of. Um, and then this is one of the last videos we made in 2004. And it's, um, well, actually our friend Samuel took here to make the video. Um, the song is made from the vocal samples that we took in the field at a protest in 2003. Um, I know a lot of you are really young or maybe new to New York, but in 2003, before the US war in Iraq, there was this massive protest in New York where um, New Yorkers blocked off from any um, city block. <coughs> and um, we, you know, recorded for the I think it was with a mini disc recorder. Uh, and then we also took samples from major parts of television So I'll just play. <laughs> sort of trying to figure out how to summarize Latibra, now that it's been a decade uh, since we stopped working together as, you know, well, as Latibra, I, I really see our work as responding, of course, to the misogynist world, but really specifically to Giuliani's New York and um, to the post 9-11 um, US global global policy and global uh, U.S. war making and war profiteering. Um, but so fast forward, you know, from this was 2014, so 10 years later, um, J.D. and I um, continue to work together quite frequently, writing songs, and um, we were asked to collaborate with the Surya, who so now we can read from piece that I love. <coughs> in July, an, an invitation came to write a song with Pussy Riot. It was from my old friend Inga, a publicist based in New York, who's been managing certain things for the Russian feminists. Well, for two of them, Nadia Tolikonakova and Masha Alyokina, since their release from prison in December 2013, have become the faces of the once anonymous balaclava wearing anti Putin art collective. They've parlayed world outrage at the government's heavy handed response to their prankish protest art into sustained attention for their human rights work. Photo shoots, appearances, meetings with diplomats and celebrities, they're busy. And now, Inga explained, they had agreed to appear on the third season of the Netflix series House of Cards, a political drama starring Kevin Spacey and Robin Wright as a Machiavellian power couple. No, she wasn't kidding. The women wanted a new song for the show, a song in English. In her email to me and J.D. Sampson, my bandmate, along with Kathleen Hanna and the defunct feminist electronic band Latibra, Inga asked if we would be into it. Of course we would. If Pussy Riot wanted to infiltrate pop culture to spread their message, we'd be honored to help. The mixed results of our own experience in the music industry may have tempered our expectations a little, but we, had, we still had some faith in the radical potential of the so-called sellout moment. And we'd never imagined that such disparate interests of ours, international feminism and binge TV, could merge in a single creative project. In the early 2000s, Latibra attained a kind of cult success founded on the political sympathies of an underserved audience, as well as, I'd like to think, our artistic daring and good songs. But we were, for the most part, a scrappy underground venture. So it was pretty weird when, a few years after our band's quiet 2005 breakup, JD and I wound up spending a week working on songs with Christina Aguilera at her home studio, securing a Latigra co-writing credit 
on the pop star's commercially disappointing album Bionic and a major label publishing deal for ourselves. We got a small advance and a shot at writing PG-13 songs about crushes and partying for many pop stars, mostly teenage girls. It hasn't worked out quite as well as we'd hoped, at least not yet. Girls get dropped, cool tracks languish on hard drives, everything is a long shot. So in contrast to the many awkward and fruitless songwriting sessions we've been good sports about, collaborating with Pussy Riot sounded fun and promising. Emerging from the activist collective Voina during Russia's wave of protests in 2011, Pussy Riot made international headlines by posing as a neo riot girl band that staged surprise public performances of foul mom punk songs, savvily documenting their antics and converting them to YouTube gold until the rests and a political trial ended their thrilling run. But their action at Moscow's Cathedral of Christ the Savior in early 2012 synchronized genuflections and fist pumping to a pre-recorded hard, hardcore punk track with the refrain, Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Chase Putin now, was quick, quickly aborted by security guards, ultimately resulting in the conviction of three band members on outlandish charges of hooliganism motivated by religious hatred. Pussy Wyatt member Katja Zabutsevich's sentence was suspended, but Nadja and Masha served almost two years in the penal colonies. So that's the fateful performance. While it's preposterous to compare Latigra to prisoners of conscience, we paid only a small social price for our rebellion, and mostly we profited from it. JD and I never, nevertheless felt like they were our peers in some way. After all, you could say we were a fake band too, with programmed beats, sampled guitar parts, backing tracks, and didactic video projections. Latigra was proudly inauthentic as a live act. We often felt we were adopting the form of the punk band for our local performance art. While Pussy Riot's original concept was high stakes, hinging on guerrilla disruption, we held on to a utopian vision of what could happen in a crowd of like-minded people <coughs> at a club. Scrolling down the email thread that Inga had forwarded, I saw the conversation between the artists and the House of Cards production team. If there wasn't time to write a new song from scratch to feature for a few seconds in a street protest scene <coughs> and then play as the end credits ran, perhaps they could use their old song, Putin Pissed Himself. They, they would just have to change Putin to Petrov, the show's fictional Russian president. I watched Pussy Riot's video for the song a few times, thinking of it as the messy, rabble-rousing template for a new thing. Performed in Red Square on a 15th century snow-covered stone platform, the Candyland spires of St. Basil's Cathedral behind them, eight women appear like an angry gem in the holograms. Their masks, wearing thrift store dresses and, and colored tights, bare-armed in the dead of winter. There's a guitar, a bass, a purple women's liberation flag, and smoke bombs. It's a television-ready triumph of no-budget art direction, making it easy to imagine the White House keyed in as the backdrop. On a hot July day, after we'd agreed to collaborate, I stared at my guitar leaning against the wall of my home office while I talked to JD on the phone. First, there was the question of what the song should sound like. Were Nadia and Masha appearing as Pussy Riot on the show, or as a fictionalized version of their conceptual band? Should we keep the sound on brand? It should be aggressive call and response girl punk, right? Or maybe our goal shouldn't be Pussy Riot realness, but rather a slicker, retouched version of Russian feminist gorilla punk. What did Pussy Riot want? What would House of Cards let us get away with? We don't want it to be the usual raw punk like our other songs, but something more modern, Nadja clarified. Since anyone can be Pussy Riot, the group's music shouldn't be the same all the time. Maybe it can be more electronic. JD and I wrote at her apartment, starting with some sped up guitar riffs over placeholder drums. It would be easier to work together in person, but Nadja and Masha wouldn't be in the US until August when they'd fly to Baltimore to tape the episode. So they emailed ideas and responses to our MP3 sketches from Moscow. Remember July, as we worked on the song, sending audio files and notes back and forth in the coming friends, apocalypse unfolded in our Twitter feeds. The Israeli bombardment of Gaza escalated and sickening images from citizen journalists paused our work. Malaysian Airlines Flight 17 was shot down over eastern Ukraine, diverting attention from anti-Putin activist Sergei Udaltsov's court day. The left front leader was sentenced to four and a half years in prison for his part in organizing a mass protest in 2012. He was accused of premeditating the day's violence skirmishes, which Putin's critics insist were instigated by riot police. 
Closer to home, Eric Garner was murdered on Staten Island, put in a chokehold by Officer Daniel Candeleo, supposedly for selling Lucy's and for objecting to constant police harassment. JD added tempo changes, switched the drum sounds a few times, and added some, some synthy things, but soon we were getting down to the wire and needed to figure out the vocals. Uncomfortable with writing lyrics in English, Nadia and Masha said we should start and send them something. They didn't want the song to fo focus exclusively on Russian politics. They wanted it to expand Pussy Riot's themes to address global issues. It was a funny assignment. We'd have to keep our references general so as not to contradict the specifics of the fictional landscape of House of Cards, and we wanted to approximate the women's rhetorical st style, a singular combination of riot girls' titillating menace and a heady vintage critique of foul power. So that's the lyric sheet um, that was on me eventually wrote. I looked up the English translation of Putin pissed himself for inspiration. Crude and poetic, the song refers to the reactionary, reactionary government's culture of male hysterics. It says, says the Russian Orthodox Church worships a hard penis and evokes a victorious future in which bitches from the sexist regime are begging the feminist army for, for forgiveness. I wondered if Pussy Riot had succeeded as a cause allowed because their liberal ch champions couldn't understand Russian. The main thing has been lost in translation and the mainstream defense of Pussy Riot beneath a bland Americanized banner of free speech, I thought, is their intoxicatingly gauche radicalism, their emphasis on the patriarchal character of state repression, their idealistic insistence that women and queers will lead the way to a queer society. This song could be an opportunity to make that clear simply by rendering that unpalatable vision in English. And maybe writing a Pussy Riot song could give us meaning me and Judy, the conceptual distance to speak our true feelings. JD was in a car somewhere out of range on the day we found out that we needed to send lyrics almost immediately. Nadia, Masha, and a few friends had arranged to record at someone's apartment and they needed our ideas. I came up with a verse and a chorus, recorded a, a scratch vocal in GarageBand with the toy mic and hit sound. Soon we got a link to download a folder of the tapes they'd recorded. Tracks which would prove a nightmare for JD to edit, but we smiled listening to a chorus of Russian girls yell, fuck me with your big hard drum, kill my whole family, I don't want to die alone. And in their next email, Nadia asked if we would meet them in Baltimore the first week of August to perform the song with them on the show in an ad hoc configuration of Pussy Riot. Of course we would. Right away we were sent scripts and I got really excited thinking I would have some lines. I didn't. Someone contacted me to make travel plans and to get me to fill out union paperwork. A wardrobe person called to tell me to bring two pairs of pants and ask if I would, theoretically, wear a rainbow muscle tee. <laughs> <laughs> I said yes. <laughs> On August 8th, JD and I met at Penn Station and took the train to Baltimore. We were picked up in an SUV and taken to Nadia and Masha's hotel room where we hung out, discussed dance moves, and started feeling like a band. Should we all do the same thing when we sing, sing diamonds, they say, or a girl's best friend? What about when we shout a genocide? They're just hanging out on the set in that picture. Uh, we were taken to catering, where maybe 100 anarchist kids and un unemployed gay people hired as extras were milling around with balaclavas tucked under their arms, wearing brightly colored t-shirts with the words, Stop Petrov in a Putinish face. I think you went here like, okay. Oh, I wore my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> JD and I were taken to a trailer where we changed our clothes and we did the thing you're not supposed to do. Sign a contract without reading it. This one was like 50 pages long, but whatever. We were going to be actors now and we were just gonna follow instructions. The truth is, it really doesn't matter how smart you are, what a bitch you can be, or how far back your feminism goes. In these situations, you have no control. And if you think that you do, you're just going to be upset when the episode airs. Mainstream culture is a brutal mediator of nuanced self-presentation of political ideals. And yet, how, how can you believe in your message without having faith that it will survive a little dilution or, fra or fragmentation? There's a chance that when the episode airs, it could be cool or important to somebody. We tried on our scratchy balaclavas and went to shoot the scene. 
The four of us ran up an alley and scuffled with cops. As the song started, we turned a corner and ran through a crowd. JD and I jumped in a flatbed bed truck where some teenage girls from a local band pretended to play guitars, and then we jumped onto a car, which we were told we could destroy. We performed the song dozens of times with and, with and without balaclavas. We did some shots where we were on the truck with Manu and Masha, and some where we crowded on the roof of the car. Big guys stood behind the car to catch us, and we fell off. Exhausted, we were hustled back to the Amtrak station, and Nadia and Masha hung out with us while we waited for the train. Nadia's husband took a picture of us sitting together on one of the station's wooden benches. I was nervous because this was all supposed to be totally secret, but since they were doing it, I put it on my Instagram too. <laughs> on the train back to New York, JD shook her head when I pulled out the purple Stop Petrov t shirt that I'd stuffed in my purse. I probably wasn't supposed to do that. We wondered if we'd even make it into the scene, if our song would even be used. If it wasn't, maybe we should do a better mix and put it out as a single. We both thought that the whole thing was worth it just for the chance we'd be a footnote in Pussy Riot history. I told JD that for a split second, toward the end of the seven hour shoot, I got teary because I realized that the hundred or so extras had learned the lyrics we'd written and were singing along without the sheets that Inga had typed and photocopied. JD agreed that was the best part. So then I was just going to play the end credits. Um, I just want to say that I had no idea, like, when I wrote this, if it would be used and how it would turn out. So. Yeah.
Um, I want to start by thanking Anna, Luisa, and Red and Eva Jimenez for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here and talk to you. Um, Anna invited me with a very specific request, which was to speak about a work that I did back in 2010, um, which is, of course, already five years ago. And it wasn't so fresh in my memory, so I went back to a lecture that I gave in 2010 about this work. So I'm actually going to spend maybe 10 or 12 minutes of my time reading this uh, paper that I did back then, um, which creates a little bit of context to that work, why I produced it. Um, and then what I would like to do is present um, the effect of something that happened as a result of the interaction that this uh, performative intervention um, that we organized back then uh, had after it was done. Um, so this lecture was called uh, Amnesia and Repression, an attempt to establish a memory project of political conflict from an aesthetic practice. Um, I will discuss a video and performance project to offer a space for the articulation of memory from an aesthetic perspective. I shall base my reflection on the concept of narrative justice, a notion of justice detached from the judicial field and focused on narrative and communication as pillars of possible reconciliation. I borrow this term from Columbia University psychology professor Jack Soule, who has developed performative workshops with victims of trauma, using narration as a means uh, of conflict resolution. I am interested in this because um, this idea enables me to use fictional strategies documentary video and performance to try to construct spaces for social and political interaction based on the memory of violent and traumatic events. Before showing you or actually discussing the work, um, I would like to reflect on a specific scenario uh, of Colombia's political history, Colombia being the country where I'm from and the place where this uh, event took place. Uh, I wish to begin with a reflection on what I consider the lack of culture of memory within the context of Colombian uh, political com conflict, a context to which I am close and which has been a source of inspiration for a lot of the work that I have done. It is not my intention to put forward specifically personal ideological stances, but rather to seek resources to discuss conflicting histories. In June 2012, uh, 10, sorry, Colombia proclaimed Juan Manuel Santos the winner of the presidential election, uh, the official candidate of the U party, who won almost with 70% of the votes. This result came as no surprise to anyone, but at the time it was a great disappointment for me. Santos' election seemed to me to uh, reiterate what I consider the obstruction of a possible memory project involving the armed conflict, which has lashed Colombia uh, for 60 years. I thought, given Santos' critical role as the Minister of Defense during Alvaro Uribe's war-driven government, uh, that his mandate would continue to ignore the needs of the countless victims of Colombia's civil war. Today, my disappointment after almost eight years of Santos's uh, government has uh, turned into expectation as he has pushed some le legislative uh, efforts to repair the fate of victims, but only time will tell what will become of this. The Colombian conflict is far too complex to be described in just a few words, but it may be stated that it is an ideological, economic, and class conflict. It is also a conflict fueled by the production of traffic of illegal substances, and involving guerrillas, paramilitary groups, and the state's armed forces. It is a conflict of clashing political powers, and it is, above all, a persistent, degraded, and ongoing conflict. These three characteristics have prevented both a systematized process of the memory of victims in the social and cultural sphere, and the process of doing justice at the institutional level through the assignment of responsibility to the multiple perpetrators of this violence. How can one think of remembering or commemorating conflict which has not come to an end? 
conflict situations in countries such as Guatemala, South Africa, or Argentina, for example, have demonstrated the way in which truth and reconciliation commissions, civilian and military trials, and the fostering of a culture of memory from the fields of culture or education have made it possible for memory to be constructed and history written based on revisionist perspectives. In Colombia's recent history, in addition to the humanitarian tragedy uh, represented by a population of 4 million people displaced from their lands by the armed actors, there have been a series of specific violations of human rights, uh, of lack of respect for human life, and of political manipulation, which I have found to be particularly revealing. In spite of having been publicly denounced and being known to the civilian population, these cases have not officially been tried, nor have the responsibilities been clearly admitted, and consequently, there are open wounds that resist healing. As an example, I would like to mention two events, which are two different moments in the history of the country, have involved the armed forces of the Colombian state in the violation of the human rights of its citizens. On mentioning these examples, I am not seeking to, say, to take sides specifically either with the perpetrators or the victimizers uh, or the victims, but to uh, bring forth the idea of how these actors uh, commit acts which are equally barbaric. I do so with the idea of emphasizing the imminent fragility uh, and lack of respect of life that is often present within the Colombian uh, civil conflict. Uh, first, the so-called false positive, uh, which are the result of incentives offered by the national government to the military to produce positive results in fight against armed actors, especially against the FARC guerrillas. Members of the Colombian army established uh, this macabre practice that consisted in the assassination of innocent civilians pretending that they were guerrillas killed in combat. These extrajudicial executions caused a political scandal in 2008 and have begun to be penalized. But their mere existence demands a diligent questioning of the policies of a government whose administration made possible to carry out such actions. Secondly, the systematic extermination of the members of the Patriotic Union, a left-wing political party founded in 1985 as part of a political proposal representing several social actors, among them the guerrilla FARC and the Colombian Communist Party. The party became consolidated independently from the armed struggle. However, two presidential candidates, two congressmen, 13 deputies, 70 aldermen, 11 mayors, and thousands of militants were assassinated by paramilitary groups, members of the Colombian state, security forces, and drug traffickers. Hundreds of its members were displayed inside and outside the country. The majority of these cases have never reached a court of justice. Rather, they propagate a silent regime and a fear of freedom uh, of political expression. A project of memory of uh, the armed conflict is a social and cultural project, but it is also a justice project. Personally speaking, I consider that Colombia is a country that uh, tends to seek refuge in amnesia, perhaps due to a, to a survival or self-protection self drive. In, in spite of the state's recent initiative to render the victims visible in Colombia, it is common to forget the past, no matter how many times these images may be repeated before our eyes, to forget those who have been assassinated or forced to disappear is, has become habitual. I have attempted to forge a, a concept and a project involving uh, the memory of conflict that is detached from the judicial sphere and that aligns with an aesthetic practice. In this case, the term aesthetic implies an ambit that is extra-official, artistic and ephemeral, of a historical character and based on narrative, representation, fiction, and communication among citizens, and narrative justice. So the project that I worked on in 2010 in collaboration with six uh, uh, theater actors uh, and one dancer 
in uh, Colombia was called Six Acts and Experiment in Narrative Justice. And it was a series of live of performances which took place in March 2010 in several public squares in Bogota during the campaign for presidential election at the time when Santos was running for president. Six actors were invited to read historical political speeches originally delivered by six presidential candidates who were assassinated because of their political ideals. The first one was Rafael Uribe Uribe, who is here performed by Carmina Martinez, uh, who was assassinated in 1903. The second one was uh, read by Duyan Gallego, and represented Jorge Díaz who was killed in 1948. The third one was read by Yvonne Rodriguez, who um, represented a text by Jaime Pardo Leal, who was killed in 1987. The fourth one was read by uh, Lisandro Lopez, who read, who represented a text by Carlos Pizarro, who was killed in 1990. And the last one, sorry, and also Atala Bernal read a text by Luis Carlos Galán, who was killed in 1989. And uh, Francisco Martinez read a text by Bernardo Jaramillo, who was killed in 1990. And all these speeches, were, uh, which are speeches about peace largely, emphatically stress the need to envisage peace in Colombia as a primordial element for the rectification of social injustice and inequality. I chose to work with three men and three women in, in, in this piece, since the idea was not really to represent in a kind of a stage, staging way uh, the text, but rather to engage with those ideas and the way that they have um, affected the life of different people and how they, they have kind of digested this text. So, we had a kind of like work, workshop session where each one of the actors expressed their specific interest in specific texts, and that's how the roles were uh, given. Um, these actions constituted interventions in the framework of everyday life, aimed at repeating, emphasizing, and recalling the same words of denouncement that caused these political leaders their lives. And they sought through performance and representation to go back to important historical moments uh, of the conflict, generating encounters with specific audiences. So I will just show quickly. Um, so this is actually a, a presentation of this piece in 2015 where the president of Colombia, Juan Manuel Santos, is standing in front of it. And apparently he loved the piece, but he didn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that, that an interesting contribution to the larger conversation would be to discuss what happened after the uh, fifth act, um, Atala Bernal performing a text by Luis Carlos Galán in, uh, in Soacha, which is uh, near Colombia. I think I still have five minutes, so it should be okay. Good time. So she has just finished reading the text. Mucho gusto. Mucho gusto. ¿Cómo le va? Estamos atentos a su discurso. Sí, señor. Muy, muy bueno. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, señor. Eso es lo que está poniendo. Pero no le he oído hablar del adulto mayor, el abuelito. Le tenemos un problema ahí con el asunto de los bonos. ¿Cuál es el problema? El problema es que no nos pagan con frío, ya la fecha que es. Y nos están diciendo que hasta la semana entrante. Y así no llega. ¿Y por qué? Que no hay plata. Buenos días. Buenos días. Buenos días. Mucho gusto, ¿cómo está? Mucho gusto, ¿cómo está? Buenos días, ¿cómo está? Mucho gusto. Atala, ¿cómo está? Mucho gusto, ¿cómo está? Buenos días, ¿cómo está? Buenos días, ¿cómo está? Me están dejando a un lado y me justo, me justo. Llevamos ya desde diciembre, no hay un apoyo en los talleres que nos están haciendo, nos llevan, es una alabanza para darnos, me justo. Yo lo declaro con mi boca. 
Nosotros desafortunadamente no tenemos capacidad de legislación o de influenciar la situación que está sucediendo. Estamos haciendo un texto histórico del, del candidato presidencial asesinado Luis Carlos Galán que fue acá, tratando de recuperar un poco sus, sus ideas sí, sí, sí. y de hacernos pensar esas ideas. Porque, que... digo, pero le cortan la vida a las personas que realmente que sí pueden saber las, las ideas. Sí, si estamos en esta historia de José Antonio Galán, que de Luis Carlos, de Luis Carlos, Carlos Galán, que fue un mar aquí en la plaza de, 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 de Roacha, entonces ¿por qué nosotros también no nos unimos y vamos a la batalla que él decía muy clarito que el pueblo unido nunca será vencido y por eso fue que fue muerto, entonces ¿por qué no nos unimos con ustedes también y nosotros gritamos esa misma palabra aquí entre todos el pueblo unido entonces vamos por ellos si ellos no pueden ayudarnos vamos a esperar a la persona que dice que nos va a ayudar porque aquí hay muchos pedagazos en esta alcaldía que no hacen sino mirar a toda esta eh, y es lo mejor eh, mucho. mirarlos y salen así y se van sí, con eso yo termino So, of course, what had begun as a highly symbolic project seeking to re-speak the, the words of these people in of, of also symbolic spaces uh, in the form of representation turned into this kind of disruption of that, spe that space of representation became a very real act, um, which helped, you know, forced us to think at the crew and myself uh, what exactly had just happened and how we could continue uh, the project. So we, in a very pragmatic way, chose to continue the project, uh, understanding that something had happened uh, of import and that it would most likely happen again. And in fact, it happened not so dramatically. This was actually the first act that we recorded. Um, but uh, but um, I guess I, I wanted to share this uh, here to speak about that specific moment when a, 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 a process of representation that has been highly conceptualized, uh, taking into account the very specific, um, you know, uh, moment in which these words from 1948, for example, would be speaking truth to power in a very specific context, uh, following a tradition of performance and so on, actually it spoke to people in very specific, in a very poignant and specific way, and turned into a, a, a completely different space and a, an interaction that I think in many ways turned that the practice political in ways that had not really been expected. So perhaps I just offered that to Eva as uh, something to talk about later on. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here, thank you for inviting me. Um, let's start, um, yeah, and there are four empty seats here in the front. Um, it was interesting, very interesting. Thank you, a few of you, for, uh, for allowing me to have some sort of reflection. Um, I would like to start maybe framing a bit the ideas in terms of like three questions. Um, one has to do with agency and effectiveness and, uh, and temporality, meaning who is the audience, right? what are the intentions versus how those uh, spaces are being transmitted into an audience or into a community that we believe should be affected and communicated, and who is that community. The second one has to do with the idea of um, appropriation uh, of certain formats that exist within society. We have seen it your work, we also have seen a certain way within uh, social media um, and, and, and particular platforms, but also the idea of recuperation by the structures of power, right? Of the mechanisms that one as an artist tries to produce with space of resistance. Something that maybe we can discuss more in relationship to your work. Um, in, in 
also in the light of the idea of domestication, how some of this work that it is being produced as a, a socially, politically engaged act uh, can be domesticated into something that is not only part of recuperation, but something that becomes part of the ornamentation of of the life that is outside of, of the walls of these universities. I will not even say inside of museums. So um, I'm interested in the methods that each one of you has developed over time and which ones you have somehow left out and which ones you think that are still valid. Um, and then I, this is in a certain way the way in which I like to always start a conversation. Um, and, and because there are three of you and I always like to talk about three different things. Um, and I was forced somehow to bring some philosophical aspirations or discourses into the room. Um, I will bring three other characters that um, I think might be useful to articulate where we are today. Um, I like to talk about anger. I like to talk about impossibilities. And I like to talk about objects. If we appropriate Sloterdijk and the way in which he actually says that the history of Europe mostly and the history of conflicts has always been articulated by the construction of anger, of one against the other, of one in relationship to the other. And that in fact, even uh, some of the current movements and, and actions are not trying to, in a certain way, constitute new spaces of collectivity, but still to delineate these spheres of anger. And that in fact, as long as uh, any of the acts, political, social, cultural, are being framed through notions of anger, we will not be able to actually go move beyond uh, the articulation of the situation in which we are in. Then we have the second philosopher in the room, and um, we could uh, uh, bring him and, and his share. Uh, Slavoj Žižek, where he would say, and probably many of you are familiar with the joke of the red ink and the blue ink, and if not, you should just Google it and, and learn it because it's a very good one. But he talks about uh, our inability as a society to articulate the tools by which we want to change its meaning. And in the framework of Occupy Wall Street, he said, um, I'm actually probably going to tell the joke. How many people does not know the joke? Okay, fine, I'm going to tell the joke. Um, and, and this is always a good way to start. Um, he says, look, and probably I'm going to tell it in, in the wrong way, but there is this guy somewhere in the middle of Russia that is with his family in his town, and he's invited to um, more or less forced to go to Moscow. Um, and, and so he's says goodbye to his family. He says, you know, my letters are going to be read and intercepted. So um, but I'm going to write to you every week. Don't worry. Um, I'm going to do it in the following way. I'm going, if I'm telling you the truth, I'm going to send you letters in blue ink. And if I'm telling you the lies, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to send you letters, letters with red ink. The guy takes one day, two days, three days, a week, two weeks, three weeks, two months, and he sends a letter. Family opens it in blue ink. Wow. Moscow is amazing. The people are fantastic. The food, incredible. The films, so interesting. The only thing you cannot find is red ink. <laughs> <laughs> so, and so that's the way in which he tries to articulate your inability to really even have the tools by which to, to structure our ideas of resistance. And then we have the third guy that is uh, uh, Graham Herman, and, and I'm an architect. And as architects, we like to vandalize and to appropriate everyone's philosophical uh, 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 text to actually make our own. But Graham Herman, he talks about object oriented ontology as a way to say there is an object in this room that constitutes all co or collective aspirations as a body. Um, an object that actually also exists between this chair and myself, an object that exists between many of the relationships that we are trying to unveil, to make real. And art as a practice usually tries to make visible those relationships, those constructs that are not there. So with these anger impossibilities and objects, uh, and, and maybe it's anger impossibilities and objects, right? Maybe even in the order that you guys uh, appear, um, I would like to maybe throw the first question after I have done my entire, uh, uh, let's say, prelude to your, uh, to your presentation. Um, I, I would really love Greg if you would talk a bit about two things. Um, one is what is what is for you a community today, and what should be a community tomorrow, and what is the temporality of your work? Meaning, that you operate in a very immediate framework, in a very particular temporal framework, 
Yet, um, I'm always interested in, in several temporalities. They, there is the temporality of the 100,000 likes, there is the temporality of the 10 years of French alliance, and there is the temporality of 100 years from now, right? So, if you could talk about those two things, community and temporality. That's... Well, I mean, community, I think, is, is a term which it's kind of complicated. I mean, I think people exist in a lot of different communities. I mean, a significant number of my work is projects are collaborative. And I work with other people in ways that sometimes community ends up being forged in that. But then there's the broader community with which in, within which I'm working, which is not the same as the grouping of people that I'm working with. And, and, and you know, there's, a, I think, a real desire. With, I mean, look, this is a this is a world where people are really atomized and often, you know, pitted against each other in, in all sorts of ways. Um, and even people who should have a lot in common with each other are often pitted against each other. And you know, I think are often looking for community. And sometimes it's not even always on the best basis or the the, the sort of healthiest basis. And certainly not in terms of actually getting to a world you really want to live in. And so, you know, I think that there is, a, there is an issue of trying to forge community within this society, but it's actually really difficult. We, we are, we, we often, you know, are ultimately confronting each other as sort of owners of our own, you know, and, and, you know, ultimately, you know, there are all these, social relations that get bound up with you know people's sort of wealth their status in society where they live i mean and all, all these things that are very much sort of a, a function of the you know a society where a tiny handful controls the great wealth the knowledge that humanity as a whole has created and it makes it really hard to to form sort of lasting community collective collaborations um and and I mean, you know, which gets to the other side of the question, like, what is this in the future? I mean, I, you know, I, 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 I'm not utopian in the sense that, that I think we can get to some, you know, place where everybody's living in perfect harmony, there's no conflict, all we just have to do is get rid of capitalism and imperialism. I do think it's very important and necessary to get rid of capitalism and imperialism. But I think in a revolutionary society, there's still going to be a lot of struggle and conflict. I don't think that it's going to be sort of some kingdom of heaven. But I, I do think it will be a radically different, far better world. And so the community people can forge today, you know, with a lot of, you know, with, with people with an eye on the future, transforming the world, not just trying to carve out a space within this world, but with an eye coming together to build a different world. With a lot of love and, and, and a lot of love and struggle can be very powerful and, and sustaining. But the point is, we need to change the world. It's not just to try and find a space that's tolerable in this one, but to, to find one that do things to change the world. So the communities I end up working in and with, I try to always have a, a foot in the future, even if you know we're tied to sort of struggling in the present. And sometimes there's a lot of joy, and sometimes it's difficult. I mean, it's you know, yeah. And then Tim Morales you know, just very, very briefly, because I want to, I want to hear what the others have to say. And I tend to be a lot more. Is, you know, um, I, I like to say that, you know, and I probably said, that, you know, my work often deals with how the, the past sets the stage for the present, but also exists in the present in a new form. And so I am looking at time in a lot of my works, but then it is seen in a particular context. And, you know, I, it is a question when you do socially engaged work, will the stuff have any resonance even in 10 years, let alone 50 years? And, and I tend to think my work so far is done okay but you know who knows? I you know in a, if we get a revolutionary society I hope that my work is valued as a precursor that helped herald some of that but you know it's, there's no guarantee that we're going to win at this moment my work like you know many other artists could be completely forgotten and nobody ever knows that we were here or that they, I mean I don't know I mean I, I hope that the work has value and importance but that that's very much bound up with whether we can actually break through and get to a different world. It's funny because I, um, last week, um, I 
I'm a very obsessive compulsive person. I guess I didn't know, but again, in the US, every kind of virtue becomes a disease, right? Um, and, and so and I watch for the entire third season of Quantum Heights. And, uh, uh, that's, that's one of these things that I think everyone does these days. And, um, and what is interesting is that, and I'm going to give you spoilers, so if you want to hear it, just close your ears. Not the end of the season, just one chapter. There is, uh, within one of the politically loaded uh, Episodes, right? And there is one guy who decides to die in the anonymity, right? Um, then actually somehow participate, even if in a kind of pseudo radical way, into the spectacle of politics, right? And so if we would have Guy the board in the room, right? He would be sitting in front of you and say, okay, how do we understand that the message, right? Today uh, needs to be delivered a message that everyone knows. Everyone knows the Pussy Riots, right? No one that is watching probably House of Cards doesn't know about them, uh, doesn't know about those messages. Um, and I think this is very much many of the conversations that within your work uh, uh, you have had throughout time, but specifically with this piece that you showed. Um, the idea of how the work allows itself to somehow succumb to the the ideas of like the present and fame and exposure and, and celebrity and, and, and Instagram pictures and so on, uh, uh, versus dying in the jail, right? Maybe versus dying in anonymity, keeping doing your work, not caring that in fact anyone is going to know what you are doing. So that's that's to me like a question that that I'm not asking, he the work is asking, right? And and so how how do you take the idea from uh, let's say really from uh, Appropriation, recuperation, and then how do you position yourself within that in a contemporary practice? I mean, I think that that question is um, like one of the questions maybe further. Uh, oh, uh, that question is is maybe like one of the big questions of my life as an artist is um, okay if you have a political message, um, it can feel so wonderful to share it with agree with you and um, or, or are relatively on the same page and you can be in dialogue with have a community that um, supports you or challenges you you know that's so wonderful but if you if you do have political content um, of course there's also a desire to push beyond that and, and get to um, people who don't agree with you who, are either hostile to your views or just apathetic, or you know maybe haven't thought about things the way you're thinking about them. So that's, I mean, if you're um, a musician, that that those questions get framed in terms of like, to what extent are you going to participate in the um, kind of um, corporate um, major label? Um, you know, big time of music versus are you going to stay small and play in small clubs and do things yourself? So um, I think I don't I don't have an answer about what you do, and I I think I've always approached opportunities to do things um, in a bigger way as experiments. Like, okay, you know, you could stick one foot in to that world. You know, you don't want to get sucked into it. And have their way of getting yourself out, but um, yeah, it's it's seductive, and it, there's there's potential there. I think I hope. I, I mean, I actually do think that the way in which it, there are two ways of waging revolutions, right? As architects, we always say you can throw stones into the windows, or you can build buildings that construct new freedoms, right? And as an architect, I like to think that it's about putting stones in the right way, not about just breaking the existing windows. But um, the idea of being a Trojan horse, right? the idea of being able to insert oneself into any existing structure, political, social, economical, to be able to really understand the mechanisms. And from the inside, I think that's an aspiration that everyone would agree in this role. The question is, are we capable, and is the art good enough, and is the work good enough, that when it actually gets inside, it really manages to really transform that, or it is just in its halfway that, in fact, just gets appropriated and absorbed within, let's say, 
you know, liberal capitalist structures that are the ones that are just like taking over every single thing that we more or less do, call it culture, art, and <laughs> dot, 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 right? So um, I, I, I'm constantly playing the game, right? I'm here, and we are all playing a certain labels with the right institutions, we speak certain languages, we have certain structures. If the question is how, how do we how do we operate? How do we produce methodologies for that kind of resistance? I think that's probably one of the largest questions. And um, I mean, it was incredible. I don't know if you guys if you understood it in the same way, mostly because I speak Spanish, right? But I could sense in the tone and the spirit of, of, of those people what was happening there. And and um, what in fact um, that reviews, I mean, I does sense in your voice, your concern, right? And your 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 um, your doubt in understanding what the start of that was as a kid's game, right? Suddenly has become a serious game. And actually we are incapable when in fact uh, many times it was said in the in the in the tape, like we are sorry, lo siento, we cannot, like I'm sorry. And and I think that perhaps the piece for me is in a certain way we say I'm sorry, right? When in fact the, the art unveils and opens up a wound that, it, that cannot actually uh, say, not even close, not even address. Um, if you would go back to the position and say, didn't even hear the message, right? He didn't even hear the video. Um, he probably has all of those speeches already memorized elsewhere, yet what he doesn't care is that there is these old people who are not even the second part. What if you would go back again to this 2010 piece? How would you do it different? Well, I mean, of course, we. Um, I speak in plural because this was really a, a kind of collective conversation we had after this incident with the actors and, and the crew. Um, and a lot of that thinking that I've done has been informed by that conversation. And everybody took very specific subject positions depending on our previous experiences. So when I come in, for instance, very apologetically to explain, quote unquote, what is happening, which is, of course, already the wrong use of words altogether. What am I explaining here at all? What do I know that, you know? Because I felt I had the, the responsibility as, as the, the person that was staging this um, interaction. Um, to save the actress from the stress of the performance, right? Because she was acting, she delivered the text quite successfully, so successfully <laughs> that they didn't do it. So then they come and they're demanding something, and she continues acting to the extent where she turned around and looked at me. I interpreted that uh, look as a cry for help. So that's the moment, and afterwards we discussed that in, in depth when I actually ruined the piece by coming to apologize, because something something had happened. Those uh, terms that we had already established uh, were um, uh, in place, and something had, that had been produced. But I could not just, and she could not, both of us could not grab onto the effect of what had happened. And hence, we felt the need in a kind of empathetic and, and human way to come and both of us explain. Uh, if I went back. I don't, I can't tell you, because theoretically, uh, you know, I wish I could have let things roll and let, you know, let the situation unfold uh, on its own. But at the same time, when you have a group of people in dire need demanding something, I don't know how I would feel about not necessarily, you know, giving an explanation. And also engaging them in a different kind of conversation about what our intention for the piece was, which ultimately resulted in this kind of com you know com 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 say, camaraderie, where he invites us to, to to do the chant together and so on, and that also fails. So the whole thing was a kind of like an explanation of of a failed attempt. But just in regard to something that you say, I also envision to change the world. But I have chosen, I think, to my work and to not only artistic work, but also the kind of a, a community organizing and uh, activist work to engage in smaller battles. Because I think the idea, this adopting idea of changing the world is one that is incredibly attractive and discursively uh, fantastic. But ultimately, to some extent, it's not something that I feel I can really engage with uh, realistically sense to my life. 
So I feel that the projects that I have been working on, stressing the question of, of the narrative justice, is actually picking a much smaller battle to understand that there is a system that is fraught and has failed to deliver justice. So how can we take that into our own hands without necessarily, uh, you know, constantly wanting to break the legislative system, law as a system that is not functioning and is in place its relationship to other systems at large. Um, how can we actually take it into our hands and give ourselves room to to side, yeah, to just to think about the ways that we can exist differently within those uh, normative and oppressive uh, norms to find the redundancy. I mean, I guess that no one in this room, this is almost like a Monty Python when he says, uh, Jesus preaching says, you are all special. Right? You are all it's like a huge mass of people, and someone says, I'm not. Right? <laughs> and, 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 and of course, he's the only one who's special. So if now someone would say, I really don't want to be revolutionary, I really don't want to change anything, that would be extremely bizarre, right? We all aspire to do that in, in different ways. Yet, what is interesting as well is who, uh, you have been talking about um, feminism, right? You've been talking about Colombia, African Americans. You're still speaking from your own body, embodiment, voice, context, what is the space of knowledge, space of action, that one can speak or transform in some ways. And, and one of the questions, and this has to do with commonalities that I found among your work, right? When you talked about the false positives, right? That the government was in a certain way shooting just innocence in order to try to have, not that be similar as when the police in New York, right, just arrest, and as, stereotyping in order to actually have a false positive and to try to get the numbers even if those things are constructed. So in an, in an era of globalization, right, and we keep on talking about globalization and, and global concerns, for me as a, as a Spaniard, I'd like to say I'm Catalan, but I'm going to take that suit right now, and the question of, uh, if, let's say, 1492, right, is like, can we imagine a world without America? I mean, this, I'm sure the Spaniards ask that in like 1788, right? <laughs> and, and so the question here is, what what are what are the what are the commonalities that we carry throughout time and, and throughout history, and where do you find more effective your own practice? There is there is another conversation that happened in 1978 that was between Chomsky and Foucault, where uh, Chomsky was constantly saying, you know, there is. The, the talk was called on human nature, and, and they were constantly, he was constantly saying, you know, there is something that we all share. There is something that is good, that is the essential part of what constitutes humankind, that uh, is able to bring us all together, and so on and on. And, and Foucault said, that's culturally constructed fiction. That's not even possible nor true to articulate. The only task that we can have as philosophers, politicians, writers, or, is to actually try to dismantle the structures of oppression that we have inherited from all the regimes that precede us, right? And and so, of course, one talks about certain universalism as humankind, and the other one talks about very particular questions of gender, uh, nationality, identity, or race, right? And so, do you see yourselves in articulating both? Are you very interested? Like, talk a bit more about what are you going to be doing? Like tomorrow or like the next month and where, is that, where do you raise your practice and where do you see yourself today uh, bridging this global con context in which we are living in that is a global community versus a particular community that you might be next to address uh, dealing with your own uh, history, past and context? Well, I mean, I feel like, you know, um, you know, I'm more with people generally um, but I also, you know, as I get older, I, you know, like it or not, I, I'm more of a humanist. Um, I find, I, I want to find ways to, um, you know, I'm not going to say transcend, but to connect with people on some level that's, that um, is not so inflected by identity politics or, you know, by my kind of 90s coming of age. Um, and. You know, I, I constantly talk about this um, essay written by Joe Freeman. Um, it's called The Tyranny of Structureless, Structurelessness, and she was a radical feminist in the um, 70s who um, wrote about how, uh, the essay is, is about a lot of things, but the point that 
really um, I hold dear in this essay is that it's so hard to work with people. It's like impossible to work with a group of people and get everyone to agree on every point. So if you break it down and you decide that you that you have one goal and you work together on achieving that specific goal, then suddenly all these like you know fractious um, things that that would normally break apart a group, you know, can kind of fall away and the you know this project oriented group can move forward. And I feel like that's um, you know my my solution is that I want to find specific projects where I don't have to agree with everyone about everything. Um, we don't have to like the same philosophers or the same music or, the, or anything, but if we have you know one small goal that we can work together on, then you know everyone's humanity kind of um, collects. I mean, I can't believe I'm saying that, but. It's your part. I mean. Um, let's see. I think one of the things that I have learned uh, from the decade or so that I have been producing works is to very quickly recognize my own privilege as uh, and the place from where I speak and from where I can speak. So instead of putting myself in situations that are uh, not mine, you know, of, of taking myself. Um, and identifying with uh, certain of the community groups, for instance, that I have worked with, I have learned to recognize the place where I speak and the privilege that I have. So even though I identify as a gay man of Latin American descent, and that has been difficult in many ways, I also recognize that the experience of so many other people has been much worse, and that the, the tools that I have gained from that experience of being marginalized and discriminated and wounded uh, in, in a way that is completely uh, relevant to my existence is also one that I can put at the service of some people that have had much worse experiences in life. So I think that I have learned to um, cope with my own stuff, see my own privilege and work from there, uh, producing works that ultimately I hope can uh, contribute to these other constituencies and communities in ways that are significant, even if I don't necessarily uh, identify or represent exactly in, on the terms that those people would. So I think that has been a process of perhaps becoming older and understanding the place from where I speak and understanding that I actually have the power to transport things at a small scale, but in ways that are uh, that could be potentially uh, important for, for others. So that's that's the place where I am now. It's understanding that that uh, I, I think I have a lot to give, and that I have been able to uh, <coughs> that I have learned and digested and understood certain set social conditions that have produced who I am. But at the same time, put that at the service of something else. Yeah. Uh, uh, I guess to start, let's get beyond identity politics. I actually think that that's really, I mean, constraining. I mean, I, I am, I'm black, I've grown up in America, that's true. But the defining thing about me and, you know, is, is that, you know, I'm a communist. I mean, that's my political philosophy and that's how I interpret the world. And, 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 and it's not like, hey, let's move back to Russia in 1930. It's actually, let's, Get to what Marx was was talking about of a world without classes, and and that communism has been re envisioned and to make it both viable and desirable is by Bob Wakey, and and you know I, I come back to that because it's you know it's it's not you know I, I think people people wherever they are wherever you are you can understand the world that we, we're all living on the same planet we've had different experiences I, I you know. A straight black man and have had, had different experiences than you as a Colombian gay white guy, and have each had different experiences than, than you. And, and you know, we all have different experiences, but you do live in the same world. And, and yes, I think it's really important to recognize privilege, but I think more important is to actually understand the world, both how we got to where we are, but where it could go. And if you see that the world doesn't have to be the way it is, you know, with, with you know. 
sort of wars for empire, with large nations lording it over small nations, with you know people di different races confronting each other, with you know black people in this country just catching hell from you know can't see in the morning to can't see at night to take a turn from slavery, but you know it, you know we, we, you know women you know we're in college and it's like there's finally starting to be a na national conversation on rape, but there's something seriously wrong where you know age 18 to 22, 23. Going to school to just get an education is a very dangerous thing for, for women. And you know, do we want to live in that world in a world where the planet's being despoiled and there are no fit caretakers? No. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's how we need to look at the world and then fight like hell to, to change it based on, on what we understand about that. And, and it is important to come together even with differences. I mean, I really appreciate what you were saying. We're not all going to agree on everything, but let's find the things we can agree on that actually will. will you know, be part of ending oppression and exploitation, and we want to agree on everything, but let's actually work with what we do in the end. And then we have an actual principal struggle over, you know, the, the broader questions, because I do really think those are important. Yeah, so. okay. We are going to move into questions. Uh, there is one reflection here that uh, that you make me think of, and it's a question I like to ask myself very often is, um, am I dangerous? I hope so. <laughs> That's a move. And, and like, no, so like, are you dangerous? Are you that, like, and to who, right? And the idea, are we, are we threatening the system that we are really trying to change? And um, I always loved when Jameson, in one of his later writings, um, he, he actually saw in Walmart the ability to really understand some of the communist principles in its very basis, right? So the extreme of capitalism is actually turning itself into the, into the beginning of the possibility of communism. And, and that's the idea of how, how do we become dangerous? And the most dangerous thing to have is uh, questions from the audience. So <laughs> please go ahead. Okay, so my question is somewhat um, And I'm, I'm kind of going to question the premise of your practices. In that, I mean, there's a, there's a bunch of ways we can come at this. We could sort of come at this historically, but I feel like I'm going to shake the ground there. As to whether or not, and I'm kind of getting to the question, as to whether or not, and it's, it's, I'll do it methodologically. It seems to me that the basic premise of your art practices is that you can, in some ways, raise the consciousness of you. And so, um, in that manner, um, bring to the surface certain relations, social relations that we take for granted. And this is the, in, in essence of political movement. And this is the way that you would address, say, state power. And you would begin to kind of shape a world that you want to get to. Um, I know that Carlos, you said that your battles are slightly smaller and that if, 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 uh, the vision that you articulate isn't as comprehensive, but there's still, I think, at, at the base, a kind of assumption that art, and in fact, I know you said this in one of your comments, that question whether or not art can be good enough to, to provoke those um, relations to the surface, good enough to change the consciousness of people in attending your performances, your lectures, your symposia. And my question is whether that's actually ever possible, whether we're actually talking about differences in, 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 in society that aren't participating in a particular discourse, that when you have aesthetic production, what you can't really, I mean, it's a question. I'm wondering whether you can actually address state power, that you can, whether you can actually bring about significant social change. And again, to go back to that kind of shaky ground, I can't think of an historical example in which sustained political action, yes, helped perhaps by participating in intervention, but not the sustained political action brought about social change. Um, it seems to me that that, it, that that sustained political action was not coming out of an uh, uh, aesthetic discourse, that what you have in order to, to do the things that you say that you want to do, you have the tools that are basically discursive ones. And I don't know that you can get there from here. So that's my question. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great question. 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 I think that's a great question.
Oh, I mean, and I should say, I'm sorry, just, I mean, I'm trying to get away from the notion of personality and then having some sort of something to work that can accomplish this, but I'm talking about structure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that, I mean, my, the first work for the public outside of Chicago knew I existed was a work called What's the Proper Way to Display a U.S. Flag? It became the center of a lot of controversy and got to the point where then President Bush the first publicly called the work disgraceful and Congress ended up voting 97 to 0 to outlaw the work. It was about a much broader thing than just my art. But that particular art at that particular time with those particular battles got to the point where this work was actually dangerous. It was the, the ideas concentrating the work, which just to be very remedy, it was an installation for audience participation that posed the question, what is the proper way to display a US flag? It had a photo montage with that text on it, and also um, a South Korean student burning American flag told the sign saying, Yankee, go home, son of a bitch, and flag draper coffins, um, photographs of the photo montage, and then books that people could write responses to the question, and then a three by five with a flag where people had the option of standing on as they wrote responses to the question. Posing the question of US patriotism right at the time that Reagan had sort of, sort of refocused the country around U.S. patriotism, my country right or wrong, and Bush was running his campaign on that ticket. At that time, that was a very destabilizing, challenging question. And so I think, you know, we're talking about a pussy rat, they did two years in jail for one song in a church, but actually for their whole practice, which was really threatening to a very reactionary regime. I think art can matter and pose quite, I mean, I don't like to talk about my art in terms of raising consciousness, although I wouldn't. Somebody would talk about it that way, I don't mind that, but I more think I'm trying to pose, look at key concentrations of big social questions in, in my work. And through that, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people who see my work already sort of agree with me on a lot of things. It's, you know, and not that not that everybody that sees my work agrees, you know, agrees with me on everything, but a lot of people have some basic agreement with it. And then those, you know, some of my work is actually seen by millions by the TV and stuff. And then a lot of people are having to debate those quite but a lot of people who are coming. But I'm also trying to challenge them to actually um, think about some of those questions in new ways. And I think that that I think that's really important as far as sustaining things. No, I don't think any art, you know, including work that I really like. like I mean, you know, Anna and I were talking about uh, Diego Rivera, whose work I, you know, I think is really important. I don't think that or the clash or public enemy, you know, you know, or uh, Tony Morrison by itself that doesn't equal social change. I think that's very important. I don't think you're going to get to any radical change, and certainly not a revolution, without the culture being part of that. But I also don't think the culture by itself is a revolution. I, I think that we actually need to, I mean, you know, we need revolution. We actually need a different social system. We need a different political structure where people are actually, you know, undermining, continuing to undermine capitalism and get into a world that doesn't have classes and the production and social relations that flow from that. Can I ask you a question on that? Yeah. Do you think we're going to get there by saying it louder? Uh, louder and more frequently and having lots of wrangling. Because let's put it this way. Most of you think I got antenna coming out of my head when I say we need communism. No, I'm not saying that. No, I'm not afraid. No, I'm not afraid. Not afraid. <laughs> my question is yeah. how do we do it? Because by screaming well, it louder, I'm not sure we're going to get there. But I think the, the thing is, the, the discourse and dialogue about any fundamental social change has largely been written off the agenda, and particularly Kanye. And we brought up Shisha. He does some good stuff, and you know, around Occupy, he was basically like, the one thing nobody should do is look at the history of communism. It's been a fucking failure. Start over, and that's actually definitely. And he's there is Russia, which is not an example of Russian for oh, that's, that's, you that's a long world. conversation sure. we should have. Of course, we should actually get into that, but not now. I mean, you know, but that's actually really important. Was it a war, or was it actually a revolution in society? Yeah. If we, I if we don't have those questions in that conversation, we won't get to where I think we need to go. So. Two things about what he said. First, I think that historically there are examples of really significant works that have. Uh, help in major ways to change things. Um, and like for instance, right now you have Tanya Bugeda imprisoned at home. Yeah. 
yeah, because of uh, the possibility of her carrying out an action that she had done in 2009, and she managed to, she wanted to do it back in Ghana, now in uh, La Plaza de la Revolución, and she is uh, detained. So there is something very important about the way that she, had, she is framing her work that is, in fact, getting a very specific kind of response from state power. And I think that's a, that's a successful practice. It may not be changing the situation of all Cubans in the, in, in the country, but it is certainly contributing to a conversation in, and, and with very specific effects. Um, the other one, for instance, is Mary Jo Reynolds, whose practice has led to actual, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, to the to legislative effects, right? A sustained artistic practice that has been put to work uh, specifically, and I, I don't want to misrepresent the words. I'm I'm not going to describe it, but I just. Uh, but the other thing is that I am actually not that interested in both of those things. Or I'm interested in the work, but I'm not interested in, in doing that myself in my own work. I'm actually more interested in contributing something to the field of aesthetics and the field where I work and pushing the boundaries of a system that replicates the systems of oppression of the larger system. So if I can do something by piercing through the way that an aesthetic practice is conceived of, written about, discussed, and so on, then I think I am actually um, achieving incredibly important social change. And that is within that, that the scope where I move, because why would I think that I could possibly, me and my collaborators, affect policy at a large level, then I would have perhaps, I would be perhaps working in the field of human rights, or I would have chosen a different path. I am more interested in changing institutional discourses around aesthetics and that field. And that's the place from where I work. And uh, yeah, anyway, that's, that's Can I follow up on that because I think that's a super important question, right? I mean, what ethical ground, right? That's aesthetic practice have that diverge from a political practice. So as because you are talking as if, right? Um, those two things would be in a different ground, right? Regardless of the disciplinary space of expertise and action or autonomy, right? I don't think we want to have a conversation about autonomy and fields. Um, are you saying that politics doesn't belong to the realm of aesthetics? No, I think that, that politics exist in on the, on a different set of terms within specific fields and one needs to be knowledgeable and understand them to be able to deal with them and so i think that, that there is a conversation about art the history of aesthetics revolutionary art and so on that i am in conversation or that i would like to be in conversation with which is a different one from the history of communism and revolution and so on right because that's a different conversation. So I am actually with you, but not with you. <laughs> My conversation is not about, and I said it before, changing society, embracing communism. I am actually not a Marxist. I don't think class is the, the class struggle is the issue, but that's a different conversation. It is also the issue, but not the only issue. And it's been an issue that has excluded so many other constituents and continues to be reproduced on those terms. But having said that, I think it's about understanding the field from where you work and being able to pierce through some of from from the place that you have chosen to the language that you speak and the knowledge that you have uh, amassed and produced. We will take one more brief question. Um, <laughs> so, as an artist, when you kind of think about audience and where an audience fits into your work and how work is displayed, right? So, my question is. Was there any specific reaction or reaction event that was interesting to you that you didn't expect? What Carlos mentioned in the square, it was something that would kind of spontaneously happen that wasn't part of the plan, so to speak. So was there a kind of reaction that stuck with it that almost questioned what you were doing and even added to it? Is what I it being uh, a specific work of art? No, no, like, um, was there like a reaction to your work that was significant that added to what you were trying, what you were trying to do, or perhaps the opposite, just something significant? I mean, in general, I would say that, um, like, the my whole, like, whole career as an artist, career, um, from being a teenager, it's been, um, you know, interactions with, um, 
involved in chapter of my work, and you know, I have boxes, you know, back when people wrote letters on paper, I have boxes of letters, and now I have emails, and um, so I, I mean, I think kind of those obvious ones, but there's those reactions and individual. Um, as far as the work is presented today, I think that you know. Um, I went into the project of writing um, a song with Pussy Riot for um, a television show thinking that you know, this is really going to be about trying to get the message out to the world and ended up feeling like maybe it was really about having this um, sort of close utopic moment with the crowd of extras on the set, you know? So I think that things always take, um, you know, strange truths and those One no, perfect. I think I spoke about that. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I mean, I work in a lot of different ways, but particularly when I'm forming in public in places where the audience isn't sort of a programmed audience, but they're just stumbling across my performances. That's, you know, I get reactions that are, you know, they're going in all sorts of different directions, and that's part of why I do it. And even, you know, this, this early work that I spoke about earlier, I have no idea that the president would be, you know, saying my work is disgraceful. Disgraceful, and Congress would be outlawing it, and people in housing projects would be standing in line waiting to see it. That, those things are unexpected and wonderful and profoundly sustaining. And the, the how people, I mean, I had this one work um, called I Am Not a Man, where I was walking across the streets of Harlem doing a sign that said I Am Not a Man, which um, had the, it referenced the I Am a Man sign for the sanitation workers' strike in 1968. And I just walked, and sometimes it acted the humiliating and degrading things that happen to, to black people, particularly black men, along the streets of Harlem. And then at the end, this guy who, I don't know if he's homeless, but he clearly spent a lot of time on the street, walks up and points, I am not a man. And one of his friends says to him, hey man, leave the brother alone. He's working, he's working, leave the brother alone. And, and you know, and then I, and it just goes on, I mean, the performance was like an hour performance, and I just, I just stopped right there. So I finish up and then they come up and they, you know, ask me, well, hey, you know, what, what, what's this about? What are, you, what are you doing? And I said, well, what do you think this is about? And the guy goes, well, you know, I, I think it's about how, you know, we're really not thought of as human beings. You know, I said, well, that's, that's part of it. I went on to the other, but as soon as I said this, like, see, I told you, I told you, I knew what the guy was doing. I knew what he was doing. And so it was a very validating and sustaining moment for him. And I had no idea that that was going to happen. I mean, the point isn't just to make people feel good or anything like that. And there were other reactions that were completely unexpected. I mean, somebody came up and walked past me in that particular performance and said, yeah, I thought you looked kind of sissy. You know, thinking about gender, it's like, well, all right, fair enough. You know, I wasn't thinking about that, but you know, fine. You know, um, so there are uh, wonderful, unexpected things that happen, which is part of why I do work with sort of this in the public. And that actually strengthens the work. I learned something from the audience, and it really is an exchange. So, yeah. One more question. I love them. I love what you said. Over there. Uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, ask a question about the impact of what goes on in the streets with the artistic creation, particularly the, the latest thing that I saw, Pussy Riot, uh, do around your garner, seemed dramatically different than some earlier works in terms of how the U.S. was portrayed. And I was just wondering, you know, uh, you know, people are impacting. But also being impacted by world events and how these two uh, interrelate to each other. I mean, I think that um, every, I mean, everything that um, everyone does. I'm totally influenced by what's going on in terms of uh, the news, protests, culture, um, and um, it, it's, you know, the context of my work, always. And, Whenever I write something now, I try to situate it in um, with some details of what's happening right now. Do you know what I mean? If, even if it's not um, 
a topic about, you know, if it's a historical topic, I still like to bring it into the present day. Um, and I, I guess that's just my sensibility, but I feel like it's, um, it's shared by many people, I think I see that in a lot of contemporary work. I just want to say, on Pussy Family, mean, first of all, I want to know more about them. I mean, Masha has a, I think it's Masha that wrote the book that's come out recently. Is it Masha or? Uh, no, there's a book with this thing that's um, the writings of Aubrey and the person. Well, but there's one that actually talks about her family history and growing up. Well, anyway, I mean, so I want to, I haven't read it. I mean, I oh, see. Masha gets them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's not in Pussy Riot, she's a journalist. Okay. Like yeah. yeah. So yeah, so you know, I I think it's important to. I mean, they're great. They're a real breath of fresh air. They're the, the song that I think you were referring to, where they basically are buried alive. Um, and again, Richard Hell says, says the last words that Eric Garner spoke, which is it's very haunting. I mean, and it, it goes back and forth between sort of America and Russia and Russian politics. And I think that's that's great. Um, you know, and you know, I just people. It's it's really good when when you know radical artists from around the world are drawing strength from other artists and other movements and other and learning about the world and actually trying to go in and use what they understand from their country to impact in other places. I think it's a wonderful development. And just on this thing of Eric Garner, I mean, I, I will make a shout out on you know April fourteenth of this year. They're supposed to you know people. There's a call from the Stop Mass Incarceration Network to, to you know, shut America down, basically release the initiative that was had and, and, and uh, you know, after the initial non-indictments of, of Daniel Pantaleo and, and Darren Wilson. And that's really important. So there, there is this thing of like artists learning from other people and trying to like to be international. And, and, but there is also a thing that we are human beings living on this planet and there is a real need to Sort of to both learn from the artists because I mean I think it's I mean you know I've learned from Pussy Riot a little bit and I want to learn more because I think they're they're doing great stuff and I mean, I'm really honored to be on the panel with these guys you know so I don't know we should end there I don't I don't know like but it yeah is, it is only eight ten um seven, seven, no it's seven, eight ten seven, 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 <laughs> There is, there is one uh, thing that I don't think that there is socially disengaged art. Right? All art is engaged in society, regardless of its own, let's say, initial agency. Even the art of not engaging is engaging. And, and I'd like to maybe end with a little anecdote that has to do with how we think of aesthetics being an extremely political project, or at least that's my job as a I don't even know what I am anymore. So you know, I'm a moderator, a moderator, an entertainer. But um, <laughs> but with this, there is there is a building that probably you should know, or you must know, or you probably already know. That is the, the Mies van der Rohe Pavilion uh, that was built in 1929 for the uh, World Fair exhibition in Barcelona. That pavilion uh, uh, is one of the early works of an architect that actually really influenced the entire <coughs> modern movement producing an entire new language and invited us, anyone in this room, to describe the building, people would say, you know, it has this incredible columns with this uh, cross shape, it has these marbles with these symmetries, it has these geometric forms, it has this inside and outside. And and the way I like to think of the building is in the following. And I, I and it's just by describing usually an image that I don't have, but I should have got it, but in any case, it's when Alphonse XIII, the king of Spain, goes to inaugurate the building the day of the, of the opening. The guy approaches this space that is elevated in this datum, and, and the guy goes through the middle where the flat is, and, and he realizes there is not a stair that neoclassicism had taught him that was his space of centrality. So the guy goes tangentially, goes up into this that, that datum, and, and he supposed to be in the middle, but he is not. So. He then turns right and, and he's inside this building, but the roof is here, but the water is there, he doesn't know. So he turns right, right, and he keeps on walking and he passes by some chairs and he sees these mirrors and he sees himself reflected on everyone else in the opening. The guy keeps on walking, goes outside of the building. There is a little lake with a sculpture that is like covering herself from the sun and says, no, King, no, this is not your stone. <laughs> Keep walking. And the guy keeps on walking, he goes around the building 
goes outside and finds me as the architect and, and says, hey man, where's my throne? <laughs> and, 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 and Mia says, sorry, this architecture doesn't allow for those, right? And so the, the fact that that architecture has always been described as formal, aesthetic principles, when in fact is a guillotine transposed into physical space. That's my argument is that aesthetics and politics are what is going to make this revolution happen. Singing on top of the end of the at the beginning of that. And thank you for being here. I think there is another section. Thank you.